progress. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters, and good morning. As we look to open the word of the Lord and the word of his prophet, shall we seek his guidance and ask for his wisdom so that we may more clearly understand that which we need to know for this time in earth's history. May we ask for his spirit to guide us, <clears throat> for his angels to attend us, and for his will to be done in our lives. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, at this time we have great need of you. We thank you for this Sabbath. We thank you for the rest that it brings, for the cessation of labor, and for the ending of the cares of this world, at least for this day. Help us now, Father, as your word is opened. There are many things that we need to understand. We need your guidance. We need your spirit. As we come to seek your face, as we come to, to attempt to a, a clearer understanding of that which is written before us. <clears throat> Help us now. <clears throat> May your will be done. May our minds be opened so that your words become clear. We ask, Father, that your angels may attend us. As we join together, help us now. We thank you, for we know that where two or more are gathered, you will be also. And we know that where you are, there is great light. May this light shine upon our pathway. I thank you for those that are here attending, for those that will watch later. I ask your blessing upon each one. Direct us now. For this we thank you and this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Last we met, we addressed, or I suggested, the need that we have to be able to read the 58th chapter of Isaiah. How many of us have done that this week? How many have sought to look at this presentation that Isaiah gave so very long ago? The 58th of Isaiah is to be combined with Malachi, is to be combined with Zephaniah, and is to be combined as Mrs. White had shown the first four books of the prophecy of Zechariah. Now, she stated in this letter, these scenes will soon be witnessed, just as they are clearly described. I present these wonderful statements from the scriptures for the consideration of select few. Yet her words would say, directly that she presents these statements from the scripture for the consideration of every one. This is not something that is limited to just a few people. It is not limited just to the movement. It is not limited just to the church. It is for the consideration of every one. We have a choice. Are we willing to consider these scenes 
Or are we going to decide that we know better than did the, that the spirit-led prophet? These prophecies recorded in the Old Testament are the word of the Lord for the last days and will be fulfilled as surely as we have seen the desolation of San Francisco. Now, if these are to be fulfilled, as she states, does this also not mean that the warning that has been given about Nashville, the warning that has been given about Los Angeles, the warnings about so many other areas are to be fulfilled just as certainly as the desolation that she observed in her lifetime that befell San Francisco? Now, it would seem odd to some people if you're reading Isaiah 58, as she just tells us, that we need to read these along with the 58th chapter of Isaiah. Right. And then to say these scenes will soon be witnessed, um, people would have a hard time making a connection between this and and the desolations in San Francisco of San Francisco. Okay, so let us now turn to Isaiah 58. There are 14 verses. Yeah, yeah and with Isaiah 58, it, it's kind of interesting. The first scripture song I actually wrote was Isaiah 58, uh, starting at verse 1. Um, of course, I didn't have the understanding that we would have today. And it was one of the first sermons I ever did was on Isaiah 58. Um, but also, you know, we're all familiar with the part about the Sabbath at the end, which I also read as a scripture song, um, and the foundations of many generations being raised up. So so there's there's a lot here that just on the surface... We read it, and we can say, oh, it's talking about the true fast, and it's talking about the Sabbath. Um, but she's putting it in a context of dealing with the destruction that's going to come upon the world. Exactly. Now, as we have already studied, she has been very clear that this is to be compared with the book of Malachi. As we will study, she is telling us that this is to be compared at least with the first four books of Zechariah. And she is combining this with the entire book of Zephaniah. Now, if we're to look at the first, if we're to look at the 58th chapter of, of Isaiah, there are 14 verses. If seven of us were to look upon this, each taking two verses, we would be able to read through this fairly quickly, but also taking time to consider what each of these are saying to us at this time. So if your Bibles are open to Isaiah 58, we will begin. Cry aloud, and spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show thy people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Now this is not just cry aloud from the Hebrew. This is cry with the throat. We are to lift up our voices as a trumpet. We are to give a solemn warning. This is not an easy warning to give, but we are calling people to understand that we are to show the people their sins, their transgressions, and we are to show this especially to the house of Jacob. Yet they seek me daily. And delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. 
They ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Now, it's interesting to me because when we look at this, this second verse, as they give us the, the meanings of the words, when they are seeking me daily, we have a doubling. Is this not a representation of the second angel's message? Is this not a repeat of the second angel's message? Because when they are seeking me daily, it is yom, yom. How else are we to take this? How else are we to see this? Except to understand that this prophecy, Isaiah 58, is written for us today. So then, if someone else can read Isaiah 58, 3 and 4. Wherefore we have fasted, say they, and thou seest not. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge. Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure, and exact all your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. Thank you. Now, when we're looking at this, and we are dealing with this portion, where it says, and exact all of your labors, where we exact wherewith ye grieve others. We are not looking to grieve God. But this message is going to cause grief to fall upon many ears. There will be those that will not want to hear this. There will be those that state, I'm a good person. God knows this. I don't need to recognize my sins. Yet, our characters are being formed. They are either a character that's going to stand with Christ, or it's a character that will stand against him. Okay. Isaiah 58, 5, and 6. <clears throat> Can someone else read these two? Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to splat, spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will, call, will thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? So as we look at this, <clears throat> an alternate reading after we see, is it such a fast that I have chosen? And the alternate, to afflict his soul for a day. So in this, are we not being called to the Day of Atonement? Should we not compare this with Leviticus 16.29, which reads, And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls, and do no work at all, 
whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth with you. Are we not living today within the heavenly day of atonement? Should we not afflict our souls today so that we may draw closer unto God, setting all of the leaven that is within our lives out, destroying it, so that we might more clearly understand that which God would have us to know? And then when we look at this, is this not the fast that I have chosen to loosen the bands of wickedness, to undo the bundles of the yoke, the yoke of sin, and to let the oppressed or the broken go free, that you break every yoke. As Paul would write, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Are we not to do all to the glory of God? Are we not to represent him before all people? Are we not? to show who our master is. Okay, Isaiah 58, 7 and 8. Can someone else read those two? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Re -reward. Now, as we look at this, we are asked the question, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? How many times do we give our bread the word of God to those that are hungering for it, that thou may bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, that thou might bring the afflicted to thy house. What house are we to bring them? Is this a literal house or is this a spiritual house? Are we to help them today with sustenance? Or are we to help them for their lives with the sustenance and the bread that comes from God? Now, as we look at this as well, then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily. Is this not giving us a reference to the true third angel's message, to that which is the gospel and the right arm of the gospel. And thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall gather thee up. How else can we look upon this? If the glory of the Lord gathers us up, is this not showing us what 
the compensation will be that we would be gathered up to him in the clouds. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the pulling forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity and their darkness be as the noonday. As we look at this, thou shalt cry, and he shall say, here I am. Was there not a time when we are given an example of a young man in the temple of God, in the tabernacle, who is given a fearful warning. As this warning is given, he believes it is that the, the one, the human that is before him, that is calling him, he understands not the voice of God. Yet, <clears throat> for Samuel 3, that the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli answered, I called not my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. So how many times was Samuel called by the Lord? Three times. Yeah. Was he not called four times? For did he not receive the admonition from Eli to wait upon the Lord? Was he not told to let the Lord lead him at that time and not go to Eli? So isn't it three plus one? Three plus one, yes. Can we not see this here? This three plus one as another example of the messages of Revelation 14 and the angel of Revelation 18? Yeah. How else could we look at it? How else would we see it? So when we're looking at this, as we are addressing these things, the Lord would look to gather us up. This would be our re-reward. Now, is there anything else that we could see in this particular passage? Uh, verse 9. Okay. Uh, it just sticks out like a sore thumb. I mean, pardon the expression. Uh, sore <clears throat> finger. Um, the putting forth of the finger. That, that's 
we're so famous for doing that. You know, everybody's pointing at everybody else. But I'm not yeah. sure if that's what that means. <laughs> okay. Well, it's actually giving the middle finger is what it's referring to. I'm sorry, what? The giving of the middle finger? Oh, no, I'm talking about pointing at people and cause, you know, saying yeah. that they're the cause but I'm saying, of the trouble. I'm just saying the Hebrew express, expression is would be a reference to the middle finger. To oh, give my you, God. <laughs> that's what it's talking about. Okay. Oh. So... As, as we are at this point, could someone then read Isaiah 58, 9, and 10? And then let's go further in this discussion. Yeah, I'll read it if you like. Okay. Then shall thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thy yoke, and the putting forth of the finger and speaking that vanity, vanity ain't. It. And if thou drawest out the sword to the hungry and sacrifice the afflicted soul, sanctify the afflicted soul, then shall thy light shine, rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday. Thank you. Now, when we are looking at this, as this is <clears throat> putting forth of the finger, is not the acceptance of a spurious Sabbath giving the middle finger to the law of God? Is not the separation that has been occurring within the movement also giving the middle finger to the word of God? Are we not to be united to be able to give a message together? The situation that's been ongoing within the movement has been one that brings much grief. There is much light that has been being shared, whether we're dealing with Colin, with Odilio, with others. There has also been much spurious light. Those that think that they are giving the health message when they are not. <clears throat> there are those that would put forth the finger because they believe that what is being addressed in chronology of studying in line by line is not worthy. We have a choice to make. Are we going to look at this? Are we going to accept what Isaiah is telling us here? Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. If the Lord is answering us as he did with Samuel, is he not preparing a people for a work? Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity. If thou provide a change of raiment, a new character worthy of you, will I not be freed of the yoke? Will I not stop insulting you? And will I stop speaking with vanity? <clears throat> and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, 
then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday. Why are we seeing darkness at this time? Is it because that we have chosen to love the darkness more than we have loved the light? Is this not something that we need to each one face in our lives? Who will read the next two verses, 11 and 12? Please. Okay. Um, and the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, like a soaring, like a spring of water. Whose waters fail not. And verse 12. Um, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt rise up the foundations of many generations. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the paths to dwell in. Thank you. <clears throat> do we not seek that the Lord will guide us continually? Would we not become satisfied even in the great drought of the word? And make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be a watered garden whose waters fail not. The only waters I know that fail not are the living waters. As Solomon wrote, he that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife. He that is of a proud heart seeks separation and not unity. That's the basis of all sin, the proud heart. That is so very true. Brothers and sisters, we seek for the upper room experience. We seek the unity that came to the disciples after nine days of fasting and confessing of sins. Was there a proud heart to be found among them after Christ was taken up into heaven? How could a proud heart receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? How could a proud heart receive the preparation of God? He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. Are we trusting in the Lord at this time? I ask this question directly. I ask it because I have to examine this personally. Every time I ask a question, every time I am seeking these answers from you. I must also seek these answers from myself. And they shall be of thee that shall build the old waste places 
Thou shalt rise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Let us also examine this in conjunction with Daniel 9.25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. As we have been studying this last week, this portion of Daniel, dealing with the 70 weeks accounted to thy people, is important for us to understand because we have much more to uncover of the three score and 10. So um, I'm wondering, can we relate uh, the raising up of the foundations of many generations as to what we, the movement has been doing here for a while? And, and what I mean by that is, it's, you know, we, we go through all the stories and we get down to the foundational messages of each of those stories. This is what I'm seeing. Is there some other thing that I should be seeing in this uh, comment? I think that what we need to be seeing is, yes, we are getting down to the foundations, but I, I think that we have to come to an understanding of these foundations and how they are important to us as individuals before we can come to the understanding of how this is important for us as a movement. No argument. If thou wilt turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, and speaking not thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. And I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. When we compare this portion of the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it with Micah 4.4. 4, but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. Here we have the vine. Here we have the figs. Where is the bramble? In all of these situations, we are being given an example for us to consider. Whether we compare this with the 70 weeks of Daniel, with the boards of the tabernacle, with the 70 sons of Gideon, We are being given example on example on example of that which is important before us so that we may more clearly see, as Mrs. White is showing us, 
that these promises from the word of the Lord, from the mouth of the Lord, are for these last days, and that they will be fulfilled as surely as we have seen the desolation of San Francisco. Will any body of man bring upon themselves the displeasure of the Lord by framing a law for the observance of a spurious Sabbath and then compelling obedience to this law? Will they insult God by profaning his holy day and assuming authority as gods to exalt the first day of the week as to be observed by all? This last week, there was a, a situation that occurred where a district attorney within the state of Florida was relieved of his duties because he had chosen not to follow the law. Now, maybe I have that wrong. Maybe it was a prosecuting attorney. But the, the whole thing of this was that those that broke the law were being set free. Those that stood up, called others to worship, were being prosecuted. At this point, we are seeing that there are those that would choose to insult God, that believe that they know better than God as to what day they are to worship. And we are going to see this occurring more day by day as we continue to watch what is happening around us. How can men set aside the true Sabbath when they know that God came to our world from Sinai's Mount in awful grandeur, proclaimed his law to be observed in commemoration of the day he had, he had ordained as a day of rest? a day ever to be kept as a memorial of God, as the creator of the heavens and of the earth. He made the world in six days and rested on the seventh day and was refreshed. He sanctified the seventh day because that in it he had rested. He instituted the Sabbath as a memorial, pointing to the fact that he was the creator of the world, the monarch of the universe. The Lord has given to men the day that he has chosen to be observed by all the world and regarded as a sacred rest day. We know well that the fourth commandment is the one that has the seal of God. The question is, are we willing to also be so sealed as was the fourth commandment? Will we seek strife? Will we have pride and vanity of heart and be sealed by God? Will we lift up our own ideas above that of our brethren, casting brethren out because we disagree with them if we are truly following God. In the 20th of Exodus, we find the commandments that God has given as ruler of the world. All who set one of these aside and present in its place the observance of a day that bears no sanctity will be dwelt with by Jehovah as usurping an authority that infringes upon his divine prerogatives. 
the Sunday Sabbath, a child of the papacy, is set forth to be observed as the Lord's Sabbath. And to obey this human law would compel men to transgress the laws of Jehovah. Human enactments that conflict with the laws of God bear not the stamp of divine approval. We should remember with what awe-inspiring authority God has set apart the sacred Sabbath as a memorial by which men shall acknowledge that he is God, and beside him there is none else. In the closing verses of the 31st of Exodus, <clears throat> God speaks, for we read, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Are we not to be sanctified in order to stand before the mercy seat? We must come unto him in three steps. Justification, sanctification, judgment before we can be glorified. That ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Can we be sanctified of ourselves? Can we be sanctified by the work of any other person, man or woman? Impossible. Exactly. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Perpetual, ongoing, never stopping, always covenant, agreement between parties. Is this a covenant that ends at the crucifixion? Is this a covenant that ever ends? So the word is perpetual, which means forever, doesn't it? I would agree. Any other thought on that? Any other, any other input, please? This Hebrew word olam, which just means, uh, it, it properly refers to, it means concealed, that is the vanishing point, um, generally time out of mind, that is practically eternity. So. Okay. I'm sorry, practically what? Practically eternity? Yeah. Thank you. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. Here again. Fear God, give glory to him, 
for the hour of his judgment has come. I've had conversations with those that would seek to make a literal application to the hour of his judgment. And they attempt to say, well, if a day with God is a thousand years, how long is an hour? Maybe we need to make that application that this hour is according to a thousand year day. My faith in God is that he is allowing us the time for our characters to be cleansed. That he is not using this as a prophecy, but as a literal warning. We need to understand more fully that which is being shown here how we may more completely and truly keep the very solemn Sabbath, the rest day that God has ordained. Whoever of the human family will dare to defy the Lord God will pay the penalty by meeting the great lawgiver over his broken law. The word has gone forth. It is not the word of a human power, but of almighty authority, of a living and true God. Will man dare trifle with the sacred law of Jehovah and place in its stead a common work day that marks the beginning of the week for the transgression of ordinary business, for the transaction of ordinary business? Who will venture to meet Jehovah over his broken law? Can we stand before him if we choose the desolation of the Sabbath to keep a law of man? Man can kill the body. We have to recognize that. What does God offer? Eternity. I'm aware that a thousand years divided by 24, so a thousand being a day divided by 24, is 41.5. Six, 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 seven. I mean, this is 41.666 to infinity. 41 being the number that is opposite in, in order of the 14th. The 14th day of the first month being important for us to recognize. Six to infinity being the number of man. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really quite sure why somebody would do that, though. Why would they take it as an hour of a day that's a thousand years long? I don't quite understand that. Well, I've had this conversation ongoing with a brother that has been in and on the fringes of the movement. So they're arguing that the day of judgment is 41.66666 days long? Correct. Long, I mean? Yes. Why? He's not given me an, a, a direct answer. He's saying that it's his belief that this is correct. Okay. I, I don't quite understand it. I mean, we wouldn't normally take this day and, and do that. There's not a reason to do it that I see. Right. Just the answer alone gives me skepticism. 
I mean, six, 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 six. I mean, come on. <laughs> Yeah, right. well, that's, just, that's just because you're dividing it. Um, yeah, I get it. I get yeah, it. But that's, 24, you know, that's so one of the things that pops up in my mind is I see that 41, and then all of a sudden I see all them sixes. It's like, ooh. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. just right. <laughs> that's just that's just two thirds, you know. So it two thirds of a year. So right. four years and eight months. But there's not a reason to. Uh, I mean, I don't know why they would do that. Where are they just going to say that? It's going to take 41 and two thirds of a year to complete the judgment of some in some way. It doesn't really make much sense. Not to me. I just did the calculation. Yeah, I I just wouldn't do that. Anyway. The Creator has, with His own authority, given you His Sabbath to observe. And yet human agencies will attempt to set aside the Seventh-day Sabbath, which commemorates God's holy work of creating the world in six working days and resting on the seventh day. How can man dare assume the authority of Jehovah and represent themselves as God to change times and laws where do we see this addressed revelation that we see one that sets themselves up as god and seeking to change the times and the laws when i see something like this especially as we understand that this is being done in darkness currently from the way that the English is presented, then how can those that view themselves as lawmakers attribute to themselves the very power of God. I call the attention of thinking men to these things. Dare you continue to take a human enactment that bears not the stamp of divine approval and place it before the people as something to respect and to honor? Will you substitute a counterfeit in place of the true and the genuine? Will you thus meet God over his broken law and stand with threats of persecution and severe punishment against the people who you regard as criminals because they choose to obey the law of Jehovah in place of a spurious Sabbath that man created? So as a, as a response, Daniel 7.25 was posted in the chat. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and to think to change times and laws, that they be given unto his hand until a time and times and dividing of times. The patient tenderness with which God instructed the Israelites and prepared them for receiving his law is revealed in the 19th of Exodus. Ye have seen, he declared, what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings, the people unto the Lord. This is Exodus 19, verse 9. God desired to be near his people in order that they may realize the terrible majesty of his power and the sacredness of his law. So in mercy, he drew near and caused a thick cloud to separate him from their sight, that they might not be destroyed by the presence of his glory. Through the thick cloud, they could hear his voice. God desired to be near his people. 
God desires to invite those that will accept his robe to the wedding of his son. God can only accept those that will choose to accept his robe, his character. Is this not what we're being shown here? If we transgress one of the precepts of the Decalogue, are we not guilty of all? How can be we be united if we are lifting up our hearts in pride? Because are we not turning aside from God when we do this? Are we not rejecting to meet with him when we do this? The habitations of men were not chosen as the place where God would speak his law. He chose not the magnificent palaces of the wealthy, but led his people to the foot of Mount Sinai so that they might be surrounded by his created works while he appeared at the top of the mount, far removed from all that man had built in pride and self-glorification, the Israelites were made to realize man's utter insignificance in the presence of the Almighty. Before the law is given, Israel was being shown the power of God. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in a fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon the mount, on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And the priests, and let the priests also, which come near to the Lord, sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds about the mount and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. Then were the Ten Commandments spoken. We've called this at times a tarrying time. As we see in the story with the apostles, there were nine days after Christ's ascension that the apostles and those that were with them met in the upper room. How many met in the upper room? How many are called out as meeting in the upper room with the apostles? Do we know? You're saying on the day of Pentecost? No, before, prior to Pentecost, yes. Okay. Well, I don't know if it actually tells us. 
There's 120 on the day of Pentecost, but. Okay. Was there was there 120 on the day of Pentecost or was there 119? Because wasn't Judas dead at that time and did not, had they not yet made the choice to replace him? Well, no, there's still 120 people okay. at Pentecost. Um, that, so there would probably be 109 people plus the disciples to be 120. Okay. Yeah, and so in, in Acts, it says there were about 120. So we're really not sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm not. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's that's the symbolic number that's given to us. Yes. Okay. We are in a position right now where we are being given a time to examine our characters. We know that the spirit of God has not poured out, has not been poured out at this time. When the spirit of God is poured out, it will be a time of refreshing. Right now, we are being called to an examination. We are being called to a time where we are to become sanctified in order that we may approach the Lord. Are we willing to be sanctified as was Aaron? Or are we willing, are we looking to set aside our sanctification and do as we think best, as did Nadab and Abihu? Then were the commandments spoken. When a people is prepared to give a message, are they then not ready to show the, to the others how the message relates to them? Did not the disciples give such a message on the day of Pentecost? Did they not show to those that were so assembled how they had rejected the Messiah? Is this not going to be the same type of message that we're going to have to give? that we're going to have to give to the world a message that says you have rejected the Sabbath of God. Consider this day who you will serve. It would be well to keep these commandments in printed form, in plain sight, in every house now mrs white states also in southern watchman october 9th 1906 for us to consider the prophecy of malachi in connection with daniel zephaniah Haggai and Zechariah. Let the teachings of these books be carefully investigated. Also the building of the temple and the temple service. Through the prophets, God has given a delineation of 
what will come to pass in the last days of this earth's history. And the Jewish economy is full of instruction for us. Over these last several months, we have been considering from the prophecy of Malachi, as we have been going through here with the prophecy of Zechariah, Zephaniah, excuse me, and comparing it little by little with the book of Daniel. We yet have Zephaniah 2 and 3, along with Haggai, along with Zechariah, to meet and to consider, along with Daniel. <clears throat> the first four chapters of Zechariah are very instructive as to what we face at this time in Earth's history. There was so much that we read today from Isaiah 58 that are relating to us within the movement now. There is more for us to see. There is more for us to continue to, to consider, excuse me, in all that we are looking at and doing. Because how can a people be prepared to give a message if they are not in unity with other brothers and sisters? Any thoughts or comments to that question? Okay, <clears throat> now we have a few minutes remaining in today's session. The next article that I had looked at from October 11th, 1906 was entitled Universal Guilt During the Time of the End. We're going to be getting into this this next week because this article is indeed very, very deep. This article is going to take a bit for us to consider. There's also quite a bit here because when Mrs. White is comparing Malachi Zechariah, Daniel, along with the words that were given to the children of Israel in Exodus 19 and 20 and 31. We are being shown that our very existence right now is very much like that of the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. They came out after years of slavery. We are coming out after years of having specific portions of the word of God obscured with garbage, shavings, and dirt. We need this word, these jewels, to shine in their purity so that we may more clearly understand the task that is soon to be before us. But for us to be able to do that, we must also then be very much as Joshua was in the book of Zechariah.
In Zechariah 3, we are given an example. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Who is the angel of the Lord that Joshua is standing before? If we were to look as we understood in the example of Gideon, who was it that Gideon stood before when he brought out the bread, the meat, and the broth? Uh, that was Christ. Okay. Who was it that came to give the good news to Manoah's wife prior to the birth of Samson? Was that also not Christ? Did not the angel of the Lord stand before Balaam as Balaam rode on his donkey? Yes. This angel of the Lord that stood before Balaam was who? I always thought uh, the angel of the Lord equated into Christ. Right. Now, my situation here, are we willing to take the good news of the angel of the Lord, or are we going to wait until the angel of the Lord draws his sword upon us? Here is Joshua. He is in the temple. He is clothed in filthy garments, and he stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. This is not Joshua speaking. This is the angel of the Lord. This is Christ. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with the change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, this protested, speaking loudly. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, and thou also shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, then I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Are we ready at this point to judge the house of God? No. Are we ready at this time to keep his courts? Are we ready to walk among those that stand by? 
No. Because we are not walking in his ways and we are not keeping his charge. Do we truly fear God? Do we truly give glory to him? That is the question for us to examine today. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee. For they are men wondered at, and, be, and for behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Joshua is being prepared. A people is being prepared today. Now, in the chat, a comment has been made that we should compare Zechariah 3 7 with Ezekiel 9 4. Why? Why would this be? A correct application. Because that is when <clears throat> the going forth of the judgment against the people in the church who are sinning. This is what's been happening. And judgment begins at the house of God. Set, set, set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Very sobering. Is this not when we are dealing with this with the house of God, is this not now first a message to the movement and, um, then, and then to go on to the others, the people of God represented yet within Jerusalem, within the church? Oh, that's the understanding I have. How can we be prepared? to give such a message if we are not willing to hear, if we are not willing with those that sit with us to hear, to allow the branch to be brought forth. For behold the stone that I have laid before Joshua, Upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. As we look at this, as we consider this from what we have been examining this week, as we come to this where the trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them, and they said under the olive tree, reign over us. The olive tree is not being addressed in Zechariah, but the fig and the vine are. The bramble is not being addressed in Zechariah. Currently, we have the symbols The symbols of the olive. The olive that gives unto us the power for the light of the candles of the menorah. 
we have unto us the symbols of the vine that brings to us the doctrine. We have the symbol of the fig that brings to us sweetness. Not the bitterness in the belly, but the sweetness. We have a choice before us. We have that which we need to consider today. Under whose banner do we choose to stand? There's only two choices. Whose character do we choose to accept? Again, there is only two choices. We are to understand that at the time of the end, there will be universal guilt. This is not selective. This is not finger pointing. This is universal. My understanding of universal is that it is all encompassing. Where will we stand? Um, comment. Oh, yeah. I was reading that. Uh, she said almost. Okay. Um, not universal, but almost universal. All right. I We're going to be. We will address this more this coming week. Right now, the fig and the and the vine are calling. Are we willing to accept the sweetness and the doctrine that God presents? Are we willing to walk in his light? Or are we going to look to set in the shade of the bramble? That's the, the question I'm going to ask. The fig was also used, at, sorry, Dwight. The fig was also used to draw out poisons from boils. Okay. So figuratively, point. yeah. We need to apply the fig to draw out our sinfulness, to purge it from us. Point well made. As we come to the close of today's meeting, there have been many thoughts that have been presented, many comments that have been made that are worthy of consideration through this week. I thank you each for your participation. Right now, we cannot afford to have a proud heart lifted up against any brother or sister. We are all here because Christ would have us be unified to give a message to this world. Shall we close in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these mighty symbols that you have presented to us over and over again. We ask, Father, that we may come to understand better what it means to worship you in spirit and in truth, especially on this Sabbath day. Guide us now, direct us so that we may draw closer to you and also draw closer to our brothers and sisters in this movement. Thank you for this light. 
Thank you for these paths. Thank you for the strength to help to be a restorer of the breach and of the paths to walk in. Be with us now, each one. Direct us where you would have us to be. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.